record. We have that. Um, quick organizational update for folks. And uh, this is this is a neat feature, Matt, because there's lots of stuff that's going on at NDA. And uh, so each one of these, we take, hey, here's some of the new stuff since the last month uh, to let folks know, hey, here's the different things we're working on and, and some of the cool things that, uh, that their organization is doing. Uh, we just attended the America's Wildlife Conservation Partners uh, meeting. Uh, this actually was in Missoula. Lucky for our director of policy, Torin Miller, to, to get to go to that. Torin represents us on all of the, the policy related things. This is a big committee made up of numerous other organizations uh, where they work on policy like that for not just deer, but for a whole host of wildlife species and habitats. So uh, we're a prominent player on that. And, uh, and actually even a little more now where uh, Torin was elected to the steering committee for AWCP. So uh, good kudos uh, to NDA for that. Uh, Hey, hunt season is just around the corner. You know, we want to make sure that you're helping our new and aspiring hunters this fall. One a great way to do that is to be able to connect them with our free or paid educational resources. If you know somebody who may be interested in hunting, uh, hook them up with what we have online. We have all kinds of free stuff to get them started. We have items that can help you, such as our how to deer hunt and mentoring programs. You know, if you would maybe can take somebody but aren't real sure, we have resources specifically for you so that you can feel comfortable starting to share some of your knowledge with them. So I'll be sure to check all that out and, uh, and absolutely take somebody new to the woods this year. Right along that same line, we have our Deer Hunting 101 educational series. It's an online resource. We work with uh, today's Hunters course. So people going through hunter education courses get pieces of this, but then they have an opportunity to go through this whole thing. This is extremely popular. I'm gonna tell you this number here in a minute to let you know if you're a member of NDA, you should be proud that the organization is impacting this many people. And if you're not a member, check this out, become a member and do this because thus far, over 60,000 new hunters have enrolled in our Deer Hunting 101 online course. This is the type of things that allows them to understand what they need and to get the confidence to go ahead and go with you. And there's a lot of people who have hunted in the past that are taking that as well to help them feel a little more comfortable hunting, being in the woods, and then being able to expose somebody new. So our Deer Hunting 101 course is something we are extremely proud of. Uh, from the grassroots end, we know we have a lot of branch volunteers, branch members on here. Mike Edwards has been promoted. Yay for Mike, well-deserved. He is now our director of grassroots. He oversees the entire grassroots program now. So uh, Mike's been with us for, for almost 10 years now, and uh, he is the perfect person for that. Also, we've added two new people into grassroots, and these are certainly no strangers to any NDA members. Uh, James Lanier covers uh, the Northwest region for us. James is out of Wisconsin. He works with all of our branches there. And Rick Counts from South Carolina. Rick's working with our branches throughout the South. So uh, I know that they have reached out numerous times to our, our branches, but uh, if this is the first time you're hearing it, or even if it's not, if you want to definitely reach out to James, reach out to Rick. And wherever region you're in, you know, say hello, uh, let them help you get involved and uh, you do even greater things with your branch. One reminder too with our branch folks is that we have our branch quarterly policy and advocacy meeting update. That is next Monday at 7.30 Eastern. All of our branch leaders have been uh, notified about this and uh, the invites for that, the, the Zoom link will go out next week. So uh, be, or later this week, I'm sorry. So be on the lookout for that. Also, all of the branches that are involved with our Share Your Hunt, uh, those vests were delivered last week. So we have those, we have the hats, we have all the resources ready to get to you. If you haven't uh, filled out information uh, for a Share to Hunt this year, be sure to do that. We have the resources, we wanna get them to you and make an impact and get more people uh, in the woods. Uh, Matt, hey, some of the Spectre camo is in now. Uh, First Light was a major sponsor of ours, has their Camel for Conservation program. Uh, what that means is the Spectre pattern which is the white tail pattern, any specter pattern sales across the country, NDA gets a portion of that. How cool is that through that sponsorship? So uh, great camo and uh, you can support a great cause by buying their specter pattern. Lastly, before we turn this over, Matt, we had a great time at the Bearded Buck in Pennsylvania this past week at the, our Deer Stewart Habitat module. Outstanding module. I'm betting there's some of the participants there probably are on here this evening. I haven't looked through the whole list yet, but I know some said they were gonna be. Uh, that's our last public deer steward class for the year, but uh, this was one for the ages for sure. And everybody, we had, with the whole thing was filmed. Um, the Beard of Buck is a television show on the Sportsman's Channel. They do a great job. They filmed the whole thing. They're gonna provide us all this footage, drone footage included uh, of some of the prescribed fires that we lit. So uh, we're gonna have all kinds of cool stuff that we're gonna be able to share with our NDA members here very soon. So uh, if you were there, you know how much fun it was. If not, 
we'll be able to share pieces of that here real soon. So and with that, Matt, how about I kick it back over to you and uh, you introduce uh, the, the main reason that everybody is here this evening, myself included. I'm looking forward to this talk. Me too, me too. And uh, yeah, I see some names on there that uh, were, were with us this weekend, so we know we all had a good time. All right, so what we're here to, to hear from is Dr. Will Goldsby. Will is an Associate Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at the Auburn University School of Forestry and Wildlife Resources. He's been there actually since 2015. Um, he completed his master's and PhD degrees in wildlife at UGA, University of Georgia, under the directions of Dr. Carl Miller and Bob Warren. Um, and his dissertation there focused on coyote predation on fawns. So that's a big reason we, we asked Will to, to come talk today and why you're all here to listen. Uh, his current work focuses on a variety of topics, including the effects of forest management and prescribed fire on deer habitat, big fan of that, deer movements in response to habitat management and predation risk, big fan of that type of research as well. Will's love of hunting and improving the hunting experience for others drove him to pursue his career in wildlife. And uh, I, can, I can hear you, Will. I, I feel the same about why I pursued my career as well. So we're really excited to hear uh, from you. I don't want to take any more of your time. So the, the floor is yours. Go ahead and turn yourself off mute and uh, share your screen to your first slide. All right. I appreciate that, Matt. And I appreciate you guys inviting me to be here. You know, I always have to throw in that last line of my bio so everybody doesn't just think, you know, I'm a pointy headed academic. I actually did come from a deer hunting background and that's why that's why I got into this business. So just to we clarify that, but well, uh, you're you are definitely not pointy headed and you are bigger than uh, certainly a lot bigger than me and Matt. And I'm guessing bigger than most of the participants or the attendees tonight. So uh, even if they might have thought that if they see you in person, uh, I'll assure you, nobody's going to accuse you. of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know. I like the idea of this deer and beer webinar series. And like I told you before we started recording, Kip, I've watched several episodes um, from some of my colleagues that I work with, like Marcus Lashley and Craig Harper, who you already mentioned uh, participating in that event last weekend. And, um, you know, unfortunately, to ensure Internet connecti connectivity and um, not having the kids scream in the background, I had to do this in my office. So I'll have to stick to the water. But uh, for those of you that are at home, you know, Enjoy one for me. All right, so, you know, I titled this talk The Predator Trap because, you know, I think that um, a lot of us, you know, deer hunters, deer managers get caught in this trap of thinking only a certain way um, about predation on deer. And so really what I wanna do, if nothing else in this talk today is, um, is try to challenge that thinking um, and take it really to a deeper level so that you can also, you know, take your management to a higher level when it comes to dealing with predators. Um, and we're not only going to talk about that in the sense of, you know, direct effects through predation by predators, namely coyotes on deer, but also through some indirect effects that they have as well. And I think that'll be interesting to a lot of people. So um, just to kind of give you an overview of where we're going, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, one of those new aspects that I just alluded to, predators changing deer behavior. That might be something that um, is relatively new to most of you. And then of course, talking about coyote predation on fawns, which is where my expertise lies. We know that there are some other species um, throughout the whitetails range that prey on both fawns and adults, but we're not gonna go uh, too much into detail on that. If you'd like to ask some questions about it later on, I'll do my best to address it. And then of course, what matters most? Uh, what are some strategies that we can use to address predation and how effective are those? And then um, kind of ending up with uh, the big question, you know, should you trap that a lot of people want answers to um, at the ends of at the end of talks like these. So, like I said, the first thing that I want to talk about today is the indirect effect of predators on on uh, prey species and particularly on white tailed deer. So you know this this concept is oftentimes referred to as a landscape of fear and it's the basic idea that uh, predator presence or uh, predator abundance in a given area can cause prey to alter their behavior so the classic example that a lot of people are familiar with is wolves and elk out in uh, yellowstone national park and how the reintroduction of of those wolves changed the behavior of those elk the times they fed and the places that they fed in We've also, what's um, lesser, a lesser known example of this is we've also even documented that effect for birds. So there are certain birds, particularly ground nesting species that are very susceptible to predation. 
that will actually alter their clutch sizes in the presence of predators or when predator abundance is high. So it would be a little bit foolish of us to not expect uh, for white-tailed deer to, to um, respond in the same way. Luckily, some recent research in the southeast has begun to address that issue. And so this first one that I want to talk about, um, I'm referring to as the Jones Center experiment. And this was a study that was led by uh, Dr. Mike Cherry, who was at the University of Georgia at the time. He's now at Texas A&M Kingsville. But he, um, during his time at the Jones Center in southwest Georgia, he took advantage of this really interesting um, natural opportunity to implement an experiment. And that's that over just a one year period on this study area, which is many thousands of acres in size, they had a 50% reduction in the coyote population. So because this is a research center, um, they're tracking all sorts of things all the time and collecting data. And one of those things happens to be predator populations. And they noticed that um, the coyote population decreased by half from one year to the next. Well, they also had a lot of deer data to pair with that coyote data. And what they noticed in that deer data is that lactation um, increased following that natural reduction in the coyote population. And that may have had, and that reduction I didn't mention may have been due to disease. They, they think that that was probably the most likely factor. Um, but lactation increased. And they also noticed that ovulation increased. Now, the lactation increase isn't as big of a surprise because it's intuitive that if you have fewer coyotes on the area, fawn survival increases. And so as you go into the hunting season when does are still lactating, you're gonna have a greater lactation rate. But what's really surprising is that increase in ovulation. You know, deer, does are gonna ovulate regardless of whether or not, you know, some predation event occurs. Predation does not drive ovulation rates. Um, but, the, but the big take home here is that it could affect recruitment. However, the big question was why? Why was, in particular, ovulation responding to this reduction in the coyote population? So they continued um, to study this issue on the Jones Ecological Research Center with this follow-up study. And they actually went out across the study area and, and put in, they constructed uh, these 100-acre predator exclosures like I have pictured here. So um, they put up a woven wire fence around a 100-acre area. They uh, put solar... Uh, solar chargers out. They charge electric wire around all these exclosures to keep any animals from trying to climb over the fence or to dig under the fence. And then they have professional trappers remove as many predators as possible, specifically focusing on coyotes within those exclosures. So they paired those exclosure areas with four controls that were similarly sized spread out across the study area, but had no trapping in them. Of course, they didn't have a fence up. And so what they found is that in general, Deer spent more time feeding and less time looking around what we refer to um, in, in the scientific literature as being vigilant when they were in those exclosures. So the question then became, could it be that the increased nutrition as a result of greater time spent feeding was increasing the body condition of these does and allowing them to have greater ovulation rates? Well, it definitely seemed plausible. You know, that seems like a plausible hypothesis. They couldn't directly test it. But then from there, the question became, became because, you know, a lot of times science is a, uh, a stepwise process. Can this be replicated in a more natural environment? So, you know, we were going um, in this particular study from a area where that was completely predator free to one that had no trapping occurring. And we wanted to know, could we document that across a more natural range and variation in something like coyote abundance? So we took advantage of a data set that I had had from my PhD research, and that work was conducted in central Georgia. And so over this four year period, um, we surveyed these two 5,000 acre properties. And I'm gonna talk about these properties again a little bit later when we talk about uh, coyote removal and its effect on, on deer recruitment. But for this portion of the study, we were interested in deer behavior. And so we used these camera surveys that we conducted year after year over four years on these two properties um, to look at how much time deer spent feeding versus how much time they were vigilant, like you see this doe in the picture with her two fawns at this bait pile. So we documented that vigilance versus feeding behavior, and we implemented coyote removals on that site, um, primarily to study its effects on fawn recruitment. But for the purposes of this aspect of the study, we were looking at how it changes change behavior because we're altering risk by decreasing coyote numbers. 
And just to make sure that we were in fact having an effect on coyote numbers, we tracked coyote abundance throughout this entire period to see if that risk was changing, um, going up with increasing numbers or going down with decreasing coyote numbers. So the take home from this study is that we did find that when more coyotes were present, does fed less in the fall and the winter time, which intuitively could, could affect ovulation because that's the time of the year where they're trying to recover body condition and prepare um, and prepare uh, going into the next reproductive cycle. And then bucks, they found, or we also found uh, fed less in the fall. Um, I'm sorry, bucks fed less only in the winter. So we saw it for both sexes, but it was more pronounced for does. So the exciting take home from this is that we can see that this vigilance behavior in response to increasing or decreasing coyote numbers is something that definitely happens across the landscape, across a real world range in um, predator numbers. So that kind of takes us or concludes the brief section that I wanted to talk about the indirect effects of predators on coyotes. And so now I want to get more into what we refer to as the direct or the numerical effects of coyotes in particular on fawns. So just to start out with a little bit of background information for those of you that might not be familiar, fawns are predominantly susceptible to predation by coyotes within their about first 30 days of life. Um, after they reach about 30, uh, 30 days old, we see very little predation on fawns after that point. So in this figure, I want to represent the range in the reported uh, mortality due to coyotes by fawns across all the studies that have been conducted within the past about 50 years. And so these percentages that you're seeing here represent the total percent of fawns that were collared in a given study that were predated by coyotes. So, for example, um, if you look there at Kipps home state in Pennsylvania, you see an 8% up there. So that means in that study, if they collared 100 fawns, eight of those fawns were killed by coyotes. And I wanted to make that clear because some of these studies report mortality rates and the break that down by the proportion. Uh, that each predator res is responsible for, but I wanted to standardize that and give you a better picture of the population impacts by showing you the actual percentage of the collared fawns that were killed by coyotes. So you'll notice um, if you look off to the side there that I've got some numbers there that I, that I wanted to point out. Over this entire range, we see on average that in these studies, coyotes took about 27% of the fawns in any given population. But if you break that down further, um, by, you know, saying, let's look at the average for just states that are north of, say, the Mason-Dixon line versus south of it, you definitely see that predation rates tend to be greater in this, uh, the southern portion of the Whitetail's primary range. But if you drill down even a little bit further, what was surprising to us when we first mapped these out as part of um, these types of outreach presentations and even for publications, is that in relatively across relatively small geographic distances, you see a huge variation in predation rate. So, for example, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor or not. I'm circling down here um, around Alabama and Georgia. We see an Alabama rate around 28 percent compared to a Georgia rate of around 43. You jump down into South Texas again, you see 25 percent versus 57 percent. So as you start to dig deeper, it starts to become apparent that coyote predation rates on fawns aren't consistent and in fact can vary wildly across relatively small geographic areas. So it's likely that we can conclude from this that um, you can have two properties that are in relatively close proximity, one that might have a relatively high rate of fawn predation and be suffering deer abundance problems uh, from that, and one that has really no problem at all and could in fact even have um, an overabundant deer population if the antlerless harvest isn't being managed properly. And I'll give you another uh, data-driven example of that in just a second. So this is just looking at percent collared fawns killed by coyotes, which really translates into survival rates. But what managers are also more interested, or also oftentimes more interested in is recruitment, because recruitment is the actual number of fawns typically referred to as a proportion of um, fawns produced by every doe that make it into the fall population and are thus recruited into the herd. So this is the number that really drives population increases. So as you can see there at, towards the bottom of the screen, 
we really like to trap in the South because these are all studies um, that have documented recruitment increases following removal, particularly of coyotes. And the numbers initially look really promising. We've got one study from South Georgia where after they they trapped coyotes on that site, they saw a twofold increase in recruitment. So that's going to result in huge population gains for that deer population over time if it continues. Another study in North Alabama showed a threefold increase in recruitment, one in Oklahoma, a two and a half fold increase, and one in South Texas, nearly a twofold increase in recruitment. But the one caveat of these studies is that they were all done after one year of removal on, uh, on a site uh, compared to a control site or they were on a site where they monitored pre-removal recruitment numbers, then they trapped, and then they monitored post-removal recruitment numbers. So that was a major limitation of that study. And there were some of us that wanted to know what happens over multiple years. And so one of the first studies to address this was conducted by Dr. John Kilgo, um, who works for the U.S. Forest Service as a, as a research scientist. And this study was conducted in South Carolina. They had a great sample size of um, 216 collared fawns, and they monitored the survival of those fawns on three different 8,000 acre areas. So they had these areas spread out across the entirety of the property, um, which is several hundred thousand acres in size. And they monitored the, uh, the survival of those fawns, like I said, before they did any trapping. Then um, in total from those three areas, they removed nearly 500 coyotes using professional trappers just before and during the fawning season on that site, which is very important. Timing of trapping is very important as I'll reiterate uh, a little bit later. Um, and then they continue trapping those areas for three years, of course, the entire time monitoring both fawn survival and uh, indexes of coyote abundance. And so here's the data that resulted from that study with the coyote uh, index shown there on the left, left hand side of the screen and then the fawn survival um, numbers shown there on the right side of the screen in response to the coyote removal. I've got those uh, 2010 through 2012 numbers hidden, of course, uh, because I'm, I've got a reveal coming up. So in 2009, that was the first year of the study where they had not conducted any removal. And they had this coyote index where they were looking at the number of coyote scats deposited per kilometer per mile of road per day. As you can see, that index was fairly high compared to subsequent years when the trapping was occurring. And then, but then once the trapping started, they cut that number way down and kept it low throughout the duration of the study. So not surprisingly, if you go over here to the survival figure, you can see that before they did any trapping on that site, fawn survival was uh, very low on that site. So you're seeing about a 20% survival rate. Um, it's not uncommon on uh, on sites to see, you know, over an 80% survival rate. Um, that's definitely possible, especially in uh, places in the Southeast before coyotes really colonized it. So you would expect if the coyote index dropped way down from 2009 to 2010, that you would see a spike in the survival rate. And that's exactly what occurred. Survival went from about 20% to almost 50% the year following the first removal. But remember, they kept trapping for two more years just as intensively as they had done before, removing similar numbers of coyotes. And despite that, in 2011, the survival rate went back down to what it was before they did any trapping. And then in 2012, it jumped back up a little bit, um, but it still wasn't as high as that first year response. So that led um, Dr. Kilgo and the other researchers that he was working with to conclude from this work that, you know, although coyote removal can have a positive effect on fawn recruitment, that result probably balances out over the long term to be relatively modest and inconsistent. So we followed a similar experimental design in Georgia, except uh, from our dissertation research, we monitored fawn recruitment using cameras. So we were looking at, at recruitment, not survival, um, but we did it again for multiple years. And we did it on two 5,000 acre areas that were separated by only 10 miles. So the basic study design um, was that we monitored fawn recruitment on these two sites for two years without doing anything. So basically just the status quo. And then we removed coyotes very intensively using uh, professional trappers, again, just before 
leading up to and during the fawning season on those sites. Um, and then we continue to monitor uh, uh, fawn recruitment as well as coyote abundance in the years following control efforts. So on site one, before we conducted any removal, like I said, we, we did two years of pretreatment monitoring. Fawn recruitment on that site, or the fawn to adult doe ratio, was about 0.5 to 0.6 fawns per doe. Historically, that's relatively low for this part, uh, this part of the world, um, where typically, historically, before we had abundant coyote populations, uh, we had fawn recruitment rates of about 0.9 to 1 fawn per doe. So between 2011 and 2012, we again trapped very intensively using professional trappers. That resulted in about an 80% estimated reduction in coyote abundance using the techniques that, we're, the, um, that we implemented to track those populations. And we saw fawn recruitment jump back up to what, like I said, was historically normal for these areas before we had abundant coyote populations. So that was initially very encouraging. Now I'll skip forward to 2013. Again, continue trapping intensively. Uh, but trapping wasn't as effective for whatever reason during that year. We saw that coyote abundance increased back to being similar to what it was before we implemented any treatment on that site, any trapping on that site. And the recruitment rate uh, accordingly dropped back down. But remember I mentioned that there were two sites that were involved in this study, and they were only separated by about 10 miles. In contrast to the first site that I just talked about, Trapping was largely ineffective at reducing coyote abundance um, over the course of the study, and there really weren't that many coyotes there to begin with. So not surprisingly, we saw that fawn recruitment across that entire span of the four-year study was relatively consistent, high, and similar to what you would expect before coyotes became abundant in this part of Georgia. We had some speculative reasons as to why this probably occurred. Um, I'm sure some of you might have questions about that um, at the end of the seminar, and I, I welcome those. I'm glad to get into it in more detail. But the main take homes uh, that I want to leave you with uh, in regards to the effects of coyote removal on fawn survival or fawn recruitment is that it can be beneficial, but be aware that it may not work every year, everywhere, and it may not work every year. Another important point that I wanted to make is that recolonization happens fast. So trapping, if you're going to implement it, has to be a perennial effort, something that you do every year. And when I talk to a lot of hunters and deer managers, they think that um, the method by which coyote populations rebound after trapping is through compensatory reproduction, which basically means you remove some animals, there's more food resources for the animals that remain, and so uh, when they eat more, they reproduce more. But if you think about it, that takes an entire generation to occur. So those coyotes have to breed again, they have to have those litters and those pups have to mature to the point where they become deer predators. But what we found with some recent coyote GPS tracking studies is that it happens much faster than that. It doesn't even take a generation because you've got somewhere around 30 to 50 percent of coyotes in a given area that don't have a home range. And as soon as a territory is vacated, they're quickly just moving right in and resuming the role of the coyote that was removed from that area. So you really have to stay on top of them. You have to trap intensively and you have to trap every year in order to keep abundance low over um, the longer term. Another point that I want to make out about these studies is these results probably represent the best case scenario. And by that, I mean, we had professional trappers dedicated to each of these sites. They were trapping over the several month period leading up to fawning. They were trapping throughout fawning to make sure that other individuals weren't coming back to fill those gaps that were left by the animals that they were removed. Um, and, you know, they were running trap lines of dozens and dozens of traps. So these are probably the best case scenario that we could, uh, these results, even though they're variable, probably represent the best case scenario that we're likely to achieve um, with intensive coyote trapping. All right, so now I want to transition um, away from talking about the, pre the predator removal side of things and talk about another strategy that we might use to mitigate the effects of predation on fawn survival and fawn recruitment. And that's the habitat factor. You know, this basic question of whether or not cover, cover type, cover structure matters in terms of increasing fawn survival. Traditionally, when we thought about this question, um, these are the two types of scenarios we might have been thinking about. So on the left side of your screen, you've got a figure that represents kind of a classic old field scenario. You know, this is an area that um, 
that may have been, you know, treated with an herbicide to remove exotic vegetation, allow the native seed bank to respond, and then subsequently manage with fire to create this, you know, shrubby uh, plant community that also has, you know, good hiding cover for fawns. And then on the right side of your screen, um, you've got, you know, what would be a typical closed canopy kind of second growth forest with very little cover near ground level. Well, the initial studies that looked at fawn survival in scenario one versus scenario two or the, the left scenario versus the right scenario really didn't, wasn't able to detect any effect of those vegetation conditions on fawn survival. And this is something that really bugged me because habitat and vegetation structure we know plays into you know predator prey dynamics across a wide array of species around the globe. So why wouldn't it happen here? And my thought was that maybe we were paying too much attention to vertical structure of vegetation and we really needed to be paying more attention to the horizontal structure of vegetation. And by that, I just mean um, the, the various cover types and what they look like across a larger scale, say at the fawns home range scale. And that's what these two circles represent. So we, we repurposed in this study that same South Carolina data set that I talked about earlier that included over 200 fawns. And so we had their fates. We knew which ones lived, which ones were killed by coyotes. But instead of um, just looking at the vegetation characteristics immediately surrounding the fawn, we put home ranges around each of those fawns. So, and we looked at the vegetation composition throughout that entire home range at a broader scale. So specifically, what cover types were included in that fawn's home range? How were they arranged next to each other? What was the contrast between um, different cover types? So did we have mature forest next to clear cut or mature forest next to openings and fields and things like that? And how did those different parameters, those metrics that we use to describe horizontal cover changes relate to probability of survival? And so these two home ranges that I'm showing you right here are actual home ranges um, by two of the fawns on that study site. And interestingly, we found out, and these are the most extreme examples that we have. Um, so anything in between would be some variant in terms of probability of coyote predation. So the one on the left has a completely homogenous home range that was comprised of mixed hardwood forest. It was mature mixed hardwood forest. And we found that those fawns that had home ranges that were comprised of that singular cover type were two times more likely to be killed by a coyote than the fawns with the greatest amount of edge contrast within their home range. And so that's represented by the image on the right. And you can see that that fawns home range on the right um, is comprised of, you know, what looks like some mixed hardwood forest. It's got some thin pine forest. It's got some young pine forest. It, it's got what looks like some power line rights away um, or a gas line. It's got some roadways through there. And all that uh, adds up to a lot of edge, high contrast edge between forest and opening or forest and young, older forest and young forest. Specifically, we quantified that and it came out to about two miles of total edge for that fawn's home range versus zero for the fawn on the left. If we looked at the mean forest patch size, um, you can see that on the left, that was 74 acres because that was the size of the fawn's home range, whereas it was much smaller uh, for the fawn on the right. The same thing for mean overall patch size, so a patch of any type, not just a forested patch. So the general trend here is that we found as a fawn's home range became more diverse in terms of forest types and forest ages, it was less likely to be killed by a coyote. Now, this is, um, I think that that general trend probably holds true, but we need to investigate this process um, over some areas that are managed under, you know, different forest management strategies. Uh, to build on this data set before we can you know solidly conclude exactly uh, which of these parameters are most important in terms of driving uh, fawn survival and thereby recruitment. So I know I've covered a lot in a short amount of time so I kind of want to circle back to several of these things that I've uh, that I've mentioned. We know that predators affect both deer numbers and behavior. Um, we've established that coyote predation rates are highly variable not only across regions but also sometimes within the same state. And that recolonization by coyotes happens very quickly. So trapping efforts, if you're going to implement them, have to be intensive and they have to be um, conducted on an annual basis.
And then finally, what we just covered is that property diversity likely does uh, offer some benefit, confer some benefit to fawn survival. So with all that in mind, um, I want to answer the question or give you more information so that you can answer the question of whether or not you should trap. So some of the first things um, that I ask landowners, deer managers that I'm working with um, when they're considering trapping are these. So, you know, how much pressure do your food plots receive? How much browsing do you see on native plants? These are primarily indicators um, that suggest, you know, where deer abundance or the deer population is on your given site um, in comparison to ecological carrying capacity or nutritional carrying capacity would be a better term. So if you've got a food plot like that one on the top with the crimson clover where you can see the exclusion cage and you've got crimson clover that's four times taller uh, within that cage than it is on the ground, and I should mention that's about a 10 acre food plot, you probably don't need to be thinking about predator control. Now that sounds um, pretty obvious to a lot of people, but I've had conversations um, with landowners that, that feel compelled to trap coyotes on their land when you know they can't get a 15 acre soybean food plot um, to make canopy or even much less make beans in any given summer. So if that's the case, you know, you should probably think less about, you know, worrying about predator control and more about potentially harvesting more does on those areas to get that um, that population more and more in balance with the habitat or in increasing the amount of habitat on the area in the areas that have abundant food resources. Another thing that I encourage a lot of managers and landowners to think about is whether or not implementing coyote trapping will divert resources from habitat management. As you can probably tell by now, I think habitat management um, is of the utmost importance when it comes to managing a deer population along with population management. So if spending money on trapping or spending time on trapping if you're doing it yourself is going to take away those resources uh, from habitat management, I think that um, it prob you probably shouldn't trap. And then my final question is whether or not you can afford to do it right. You know, there's nothing wrong with trapping um, uh, for, you know, pleasure, entertainment, kind of similar to, you know, how we deer hunt. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but if you're doing it to try to control a population of predators and benefit fawn survival and thereby recruitment, um, it has to be a much more intensive effort. Like I said, you know, putting out a few traps um, across a relatively large property and trapping for a week or two probably isn't going to really have a population level effect when it comes to coyotes. So you want to make sure that you're doing it right in the months leading up to fawning and through fawning and keeping that population low um, until those fawns are out of that vulnerability period during the first 30 days. So kind of some closing thoughts on this. Um, and I've got a picture there of me with a coyote to show that I'm not anti-trapping. Um, I think it's a very valuable tool. It just needs to be understood and prescribed um, where it's actually probably going to serve some benefit. And then we need to have realistic expectations when we do it. So I always like to leave um, leave folks when I talk about this topic uh, with this uh, with the statement that reduced doe harvest is always the cheapest and the most surefire way um, to increase a population or to account for predation. And then of course, um, it's hard to say it better than Leopold himself. If a habitat can't support game in spite of predators, it simply isn't good game habitat. So I'll turn it back over to you guys and hopefully we have some questions and can follow up with interesting discussion. I'm sure I've spurred some of that. Very awesome. good. Well, go ahead and uh, there we go. Yeah, excellent job. Excellent, excellent job. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is the whole predator thing a few years ago in the Southeast, you know, was getting all the press. This is what all the magazine articles are about. And uh, so I am, I feel like we're finally at a place where we can start to, to really Get our, our wrap our hands around what's going on because for a while you know oh yeah if we catch some coyotes oh we have more fawns and that was great then all of a sudden it was like yeah but the next year all of a sudden we don't have more fawns so there was a whole period you were kind of in flux like yeah. do we really have an understanding of this or not and uh you did an excellent job tonight and, uh, and i do think that we finally are at a place where we have looked at enough or you and your colleagues have looked at enough of the different factors you know to, to really make a statement and, and get a good sense of hey this is really where we are we can really ask some good questions now to understand how to, to go forward from this so uh, yeah and i think and i think you know kip you pointed out you made an important point that 
Um, it was a very hot topic in the South several years ago. And for good reason, you know, hunters had enjoyed decades of being the primary mortality source for all deer, you know, so we had complete control of a population with the trigger finger. And when some of that was, some of that control was taken away from us, it's easy to, you know, get a little bit freaked out. No, sure. And, uh, and I did say this out there, uh, but I, I'll assure you it was, it was talked about just as much here in Pennsylvania and, uh, and many other Northern states as well with regard to, because, you know, most of the research was coming out of the South. And one of the cool things today is, you know, hunters have far more access to, to good information than ever before. So uh, whether you lived in Maine, Michigan, Pennsylvania, or somewhere else, uh, they were well aware of the research that you were doing and, uh, and your colleagues on this. So, uh, well, good deal. Well, Matt, let's go ahead and uh, start the questions. I'll let you have the first one. All right. Sounds good. Uh, first question in the Q&A. And as a reminder, uh, type in your questions in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, if you can, we'll, we'll look at the chat. But um, going at the very top on the Q&A, uh, Will, we have what method was used to remove coyotes on those two 5,000 acre units and what percentage reduction was achieved? I think that question came in pretty early when you're talking about the indirect effects and then you may have addressed it a little bit later, but just mm -hmm. as a reminder, yeah. um, could you answer that? Yeah, it was all foothold trapping. Um, so primarily we're using number two traps uh, for coyotes and we reduced the population that first year of trapping on the one site by about 80%. And then in the second year of trapping, we weren't effective in uh, effective in affecting <laughs> that population at all. Good deal. Next one, let's take on, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead and get the second part of that then. He, he got it. Oh, yeah. gotcha. oh, gotcha. Okay, I was, I was looking at this next one here. Will, um, along those lines then, um, one of the guys said that, you know, hey, well then if this is the case in the easiest way is to reduce antlers harvest, then how do we determine how many does we're supposed to kill? That's a tough one. <laughs> when I and when I work with landowners, I feel like that's the toughest question to answer um, without establishing a history with the property. Uh, I like to start out relatively conservative. Um, and Kit, I'm sure that you have you know uh, a rule of thumb that you stick to. You know, I generally consider, and I don't want anybody to stick to these numbers as gospel truth, because some some places, you know, what I say will allow a population to increase would decrease a population elsewhere. But, you know, a good starting point for me is a doe per 100 acres to maintain a stable population and up that to two per 100 acres to decrease the population. But it depends on the property size. It depends on the doe harvest on the surrounding properties. So for instance, you may need to kill four or five does per hundred acres if none of the surrounding properties are harvesting any does. I would say, you know, as my rule of thumb is start out conservative. And if you're still seeing impacts on vegetation, increase that number slowly over time until those impacts start to subside. Um, or if the population is lower and you're not seeing any impacts on vegetation and you're seeing large numbers of deer when you hunt, uh, or, or I'm sorry, you're not seeing any impacts on vegetation. You're seeing very low numbers when you hunt. Maybe take a couple years off of any doe harvest and see how the population responds. No, oh, great answer. And then actually, uh, I think that is one of the most difficult questions that that folks can get. And from a, a hunter's perspective or landowners, that is a, because of that. We actually can go to our website. It's called Doe Harvest Diagnosis. You can go there. This is a free uh, sheet you can grab. We actually can walk folks through a step by step process and allow them to use site specific information and just check off yes or no to each of these different questions. And then when they get to the end, give them some information uh, or allow them a much better predictor of about how many does they should be shooting. So uh, we've had some different things like this over the years. Matt put this together uh, a couple of years ago and is a great, great resource for folks that covers all of those parameters that you just said, you know, relative to neighbors, uh, relative to habitat quality, et cetera. So um, yeah, it's a free resource at deerassociation.com. Uh, folks can go and grab that and uh, get themselves really close to where they need to be from it. Awesome. How'd you print that out so fast, Kip? I'm fast. I'm fast. <laughs> Man, I was going to mention the same thing, but you beat me to it. All right, well, we got another question. Uh, and there's quite a few here, which is good. While attempting to trap coyotes, how often are the fawns accidentally trapped or other good game animals? So uh, those incidentals, does that type of stuff happen? Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know about fawns, but adult deer step in foothold traps all the time. And the way foothold traps are designed, their feet just pop, right, they slide right out. Um, you know, you really, they're, they're called foothold traps because they're specifically designed to grab around the ankle or the foot of an animal with a pad. Um, so, you know, if you think about your dog, you know, their toes are larger than the ankle. So it, that trap just holds on and won't slide over. Um, so a deer has no problem pulling its foot out. And you usually see the signs uh, in the area around the trap where it stepped in, the deer start, made a couple hops and then it was gone. The only instance I've seen of bycatch of a game animal with foothold traps is I have seen one turkey hen that got caught in a foothold trap, um, stayed in there probably overnight and died likely due to stress. But that is over thousands and thousands of trap nights after, you know, working on these trap lines, uh, both for recreation and for research purposes. Perfect. That's a good answer. Habitat related one here, Will. Uh, you referenced edges uh, in your talk. Uh, one of the, the attendees asked, how wide are those edges supposed to be? That's a good question. So that's why I mentioned that we need to do more of this research on areas that are managed a bit differently. Um, the way this site was managed, essentially the edges were just a transition oftentimes between mature forest and opening. Um, so these aren't the ideal soft edges that we like to create, say around food plots or fallow fields that we're managing for deer where, you know, we're reducing the canopy some at the edge of the mature forest and allowing that brushy transition corridor um, between the forest and the opening. Um, so the good news about that though, is that we have that we see that any type of edge is beneficial. So likely if you're taking it a step further and trying to manage those edges to be wider and have more plant diversity, better cover for deer, you're gonna see an even more positive impact. I think that also by just having a diversity in these cover types and a lot of edge, you're almost overwhelming the coyote, which is a coursing predator. It likes to follow um, these landscape patterns, you know, these trails just like we do, just like deer do. And as you increase the complexity of that more and more, they can't target specific areas thinking that that's where the fawn's gonna be. You know, there's so much of it, it's almost like they're overwhelmed and you decrease the probability that they're gonna detect any given individual that's any in a individual fawn that's bedded in one of those areas. You know, one I one thing I found interesting about that, Will, was um, I remember when the, your study came out and we we learned about it at um, the Southeast Deer Study Group. And uh, around the same time, we had a, one of our deer steward modules that we had done um, about trapping and predator management. I, I remember the speaker that we had a professional trapper come and speak and talked about how coyotes travel a lot of roads, right of ways. And it seems almost counterintuitive that the place that has a lot more of those thoroughfares for coyotes to travel tend to mm -hmm. see that. But I mean, you, you found it, which is a, which is a pretty amazing thing. And that's the thing you have to remember too, Matt, is that those edges also correlate with habitat diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, so they may they may facilitate travel, but at the same time, if you've got greater diversity, g deer being a generalist species, they're going to benefit from that. Absolutely. You know, and, and I think it also points to another issue that it's not the quality of cover that you have in a given area. It's also the quantity. Mm -hmm. So if you have if you have a 50 acre property and you have two acres of really good fawning cover on it, that could just be a sink, a target for coyotes to go to and depredate fawns. Whereas if I have 50 acres and I have 10 two acre patches spread out across it, that might be a little bit extreme, but let's say I have five one acre patches or something like that. I've distributed it a lot more across the landscape. And you would expect that as you start to build on that more and more, that it's, it's gonna probably benefit fawn survival. And we also know that areas like that benefit deer nutrition as well, right? So it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. a, great, a great take home. Um, let's move uh, the next question we have any correlation found uh, related to environmental impacts on the studies during the periods like drought um, do you I, I can think of one recent research that talked about where it didn't have predators involved with fawn survival but um, the question about environmental impacts on the studies that you talked about did, do you remember any no, we didn't really look at that. Um, and most of the areas that I'm familiar with in this research is coming out of, we get 50 to 60 inches of rainfall a year. 
Um, if you go down to more arid places like South Texas, I know that fawn crops are much more dependent on rainfall. And I would expect, you know, that to be a lot more likely to occur there. Will, just to clarify or to make sure that this, this person understands exactly what your recommendation was, uh, says, so if I don't have the resources to track heavily or pay a professional during the farming season, it's not likely worth the effort to trap? I would agree. You know, like I reported, even with the professional trappers trapping for months on end in that period leading up to and during fawning, we only saw a, mos a, a modest positive benefit. Um, so if you know, for the weekend warrior, especially on a small property um, that's not a professional trapper, you know, I would rather you be out there improving habitat, you know, doing some some forest stand improvement, maybe some prescribed fire, native vegetation, other native vegetation management actions to try to benefit that population. Matt and I will echo that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. From personal experience, not only is it enjoyable, but I found you get better gains faster watching deer populations climb or go down just by trigger management and working on the habitat stuff we can control. Right. Um, in, in wintertime, when you're trapping is the prime time to implement. If you're doing any kind of, you know, girdle and squirt, girdle and spray, like Dr. Harper recommends, it's the prime time to be doing that stuff as well as burning. Well, if you're going to trap, we have a question about how to do that. How do you determine the best locations to set traps and how often do you check them? So uh, make sure you check into your state's regulations for, you know, the period, the duration between trap uh, checks. Most states are 24 hours. Some of them, you know, vary from that. But um, as far as where you're targeting to trap on a property, you're looking for um, intersections of roads um alongside you know fields and other openings around hay fields clear cuts any of the food plots those types of areas are all generally good to target good deal uh, the next question is for matt matt what was the name of that sheet that i just said uh, that you wrote <laughs> that's a uh, doe harvest diagnosis that's right so uh deerassociation.com doe harvest diagnosis it's an article that's got an attachment as, as a link that you can download and print. Uh, we got a question here. Could the edge habitat on the studies that you and I were just talking about, Will, ultimately create more early successional habitat for coyotes' primary prey of rabbits, rodents, um, those, thus taking pressure off of fawns due to more prey other than the fawns? It's a great it question. Definitely, it definitely could, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, we refer to that as the alternative prey hypothesis. And in the studies that I've been involved in, we haven't been able to find any evidence for that because if we look at food habits, coyotes will eat the heck out of all that stuff right up until fawns start hitting the ground. And then even if it's available, they switch over to fawns as soon as, as soon as they're available in the landscape. So I wish it worked that way, but it doesn't seem to, at least in the data that we've collected. Thanks so much, Will. We made it through all the questions. We only got three minutes left, so we're gonna we're gonna close things out here, um, and we're gonna give away the prize in in a, in a minute. So stick around, folks. Don't close off yet. Um, just a reminder: if you're not a member of the National Deer Association, we bring these uh, to you free. We have lots of free resources like that uh, publication we just talked about, and just really thousands of things, videos. Uh, um, blogs, everything else on, on social media, uh, but we still need your support. So if you're not a member, please join. Uh, you can do that right there on our website. Kip, what's up next month? Um, and super, super thanks, Will, for tonight. This was awesome. So uh, I appreciate our friendship, the opportunity for you spending your evening uh, with us tonight and, uh, and sharing this great information with us. So uh, my hat's off to you. That was well done. And uh, thank you for, for being a part of this. I enjoyed it. Good to be back together again, even if just virtually. <laughs> Good deal. Our next webinar, Matt, is uh, Monday, September 13th. Our very own Hank Forrester, our director of hunting, is going to be talking about NDA, uh, our mentoring, and NDA's field to fork program. So uh, perfect timing relative to hunting seasons getting started. All kinds of exciting stuff happening right now with, uh, with numbers of field to forks and uh, around the country. So uh, that's going to be next month. So perfect. I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, let's, give a, let's make somebody real happy with this prize. Yep. We can do that. All right. So typically what I do is ask a question. You're going to type the answer in the chat, not the Q&A. So go back to the chat, seeing lots of positive comments. Will, as I have that up here, excellent presentation. Uh, people really enjoyed it. So my question, first one to type in the chat, the answer to this is going to win um, a book.
um, if you can see it, it's called Predator Management, uh, Predator Population Management with Predators by Clint Carey. He's actually the, the professional trapper that I mentioned uh, a little earlier that came and spoke at one of our classes. Um, he wrote a book on how and where uh, to set those traps if you're going to do it. So a little information will ship this to you. Um, so when I announce it, please uh, type your name in. And uh, uh, when I announce whoever wins, we're, we're going to get your contact information. So, all right, the question, getting to it. Um, will showed a map of the United States that showed a variety of data from studies across the country of the percent of collared fawns killed by coyotes. What was the national average across mm. all of those studies? So oh, as I go fast. here, that was fast. Yep, I've tried to make it easy. Um, we got, looks like Mark Sands typed in 27. That's right, Mark, 27%. Lots of people got it right. A lot of people got it close. Uh, but Mark, please email me at matt at deerassociation.com. And uh, you and I will exchange contact information. I'll make sure we can get this book to you. Um, what else, Kip? We are right at eight o'clock. So we're at the top of the hour. If nothing else, we're prompt, I guess. So uh, a huge thanks to Will again. Matt, congrats to your daughters and, uh, and their cousins on the fishing tournament. Tell them I said uh, I'm proud of them. Congratulations. Have a great night, everybody. And uh, come see us again next month. We'll see you. See ya.